Welcome to part two of the 2023 review of the Paleo Post podcast. Absolutely. And I think that is a good place for us to go to our next topic, which I just want to make sure. Now, I do want to bring up a topic that we weren't, that I didn't mention earlier, um, that I think would be great to talk about, and that is the creation of the first Acheulean tools, which was, I think, if we have actually found a location where we can see this happening in the archaeological record, it'd be massive for understanding of lithics, our adaptations, and why we adapted the way we did. Because the Acheulean hand axe, which is still made today by you know people who are studying them, is the oldest usable stone tool, tool that was ever used in my knowledge it was used for over two million years as a literally an everything tool so to understand where it came from is very important now an Acheulean hand axe i've shown you guys pictures before of the one i have it literally think of like a teardrop with sharpened edges and a side that you could typically hold and they're mostly associated with Homo erectus, uh, unless they left Africa prior to the creation of Acheulean tools. For example, the possible Homo erectus in Georgia, which some people consider to be called Homo georgicus. We'll see about that. They do not have Acheulean tools. They have Oldowan tools because they left Africa so early. Now, there was this site found in Ethiopia on this plateau, which is strange enough to begin with, because you don't usually find hominins on plateaus living at higher altitudes. is kind of strange for us. We need physical adaptations or cultural adaptations to survive. And we found a community of Homo erectus where, in the beginning, you know, the earlier stages, the deeper layers of this uh, sediment, there are Oldowan tools. And I don't remember over the exact period, because I don't have the paper in front of me, they actually slowly transition into Acheulean tools. And this is the only location that any archaeologist has found with both Oldowan and Acheulean tools associated with Homo erectus. Which might lead some to believe that something in that plateau, something in that area, led to Homo erectus, which was, of course, the first fully upright very large brained hominin to adapt and create a new set of tools that they could teach, show, and be repeated for millions of years. And if we have found, and I'm sure, you know, this was another big thing that happened this year. Um, we kind of got away from the idea that Homo sapiens originated in one place in Africa. We've kind of accepted the idea that there were not a multi-regional model, but that there were multiple regions in Africa where Homo sapiens evolved from wherever we evolved from. And so this could have just been one site where the Acheulean hand axe was created, but so far it's the only one that we have that even links to it. And it's almost 2 million years old, which goes a little out of the date of Acheulean hand axes anyway. So. I think that was a huge story of 2023 because there's so much more work to be done at that site. And I think once we know more about the origins of these tools, we can learn more about why they were made, which goes along with what I want to focus on for my PhD, which is imagination and why we did things and how we figured things out. And the ways that I think we can do that is by looking at art and stone tools, lithics, things like that. So when there are stories that come up about oldest stone tools and things like that, I, I find them very fascinating. Hmm. Can, I, can I ask you a question, Seth? Absolutely. Um, I, mean, I mean, do you do think there's a lot to do with the ergonomics of, of stone tool production between the two, between the old, two old industries? Um, uh, and also, can, I, I don't know if you, when you, when you read the paper, did you, did anybody explain that there could be a, a sort of a um, a, um, a a link up with to do with ergonomics, symmetry, uh, functionality between the old 
tool system and the new tool system that you were talking about. What I read, there was not something on the ergonomics, not in that paper that I recall, but that brings up a very good point, because like, if you think about it, a homo habilis has a much smaller hand mm. than a homo erectus would, and an old one tool is more of a, just a stone that you could hold in the hand, whereas in a Shulian hand axe, I mean, I'm holding up my hands, but pe- obviously people can't see it. They could be big. They just found... Massive, yeah. They just found in Saudi Arabia a 20-inch long hand axe and with both sides sharpened. They don't know what it was used for, but, I mean, these things could have been huge. So I fully believe, now that you mention it morphologically, uh, Homo erectus might have just been able to ergonomically grasp these tools better and use them more effectively, and maybe uh, there was just a homo habilis or an australopithecus prior to that, because we now know stone tools are so much older than homo and just. Yeah. Um, that makes a very good point. And I can see the ergonomics and the morphology of the hand definitely playing a role in the type of tool used. And so that does make sense that, the hand axe was the longest running stone tool because Homo erectus is also the longest living hominin of, you know, near like 2 million years or something, 1.5 million years. Um, so that is very possible, I think, now that you mentioned it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, again, it's, and again, it's all about this idea about sort of cognition and about design. Uh, you know, the ergonomics and the symmetry, the size, I mean, Who's not to say that these larger axes weren't two-handed axes? We right. are holding the holding the butt end of the butt, yeah, the butt end, and you're you're putting down on the point for whatever reason. Uh, I mean, they've they've got they've got to be made to be used. That's if we consider them to be tools in the in the true sense of the word, because as we know, come back, come back to my beloved Neolithic, for example, that a lot of these polystone axes we see certainly within Europe and in North Africa. Those aren't tools at all. They are symbolic items which have uh, the the idea of of being a tool, but they're not. They're they're symbolic items which are moved around the landscape. They're almost like almost like a currency, a symbolic currency. Now, I'm not suggesting for one minute that Australian hand axes are those sort of tools without that sort of function. Uh, what I am saying is that you know, take into consideration the symmetry, the ergonomics, the shape. And also the consistency of the design over many hundreds of thousands of years, right through to Neanderthals using these axes. axes. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, there's something going on there, which we, which we, you know, it's almost like a blueprint going through time and space, uh, which we, you, you, which we need, which needs to be talked about, really. Absolutely. But not by, but not by me. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that is such an important point that you make it is almost like a blueprint which we don't see things like that in other primates we don't see repeatable patterns Um, yeah to me patterns and i think to anyone who would study geometric signs or arts patterns are such an important thing um and so to think about you know stone tools obviously that's what we call a complex in industry is a pattern yeah. of yeah. the same yeah. tool over and over again. And you only, you know, we do see other primates using quote unquote tools again, quote unquote, you know, we see macaques smashing nuts with hammer stones. To me, what is the difference between that and an old one tool? I don't really know. I mean, maybe it's the intent. I, I don't know. When we get to those very fine details between what is the most basic version of a stone tool which we now know were the Lamequian tools 3.3 million years ago versus um i i is it in fongoli where the chimps throw rocks at trees or something yes 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 um so i mean what does that mean what 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 is that about so again this theme that i think you've presented for season two of we need to view things from not a 21st century homo sapien perspective to really learn more. Cause I think we've done that enough, right? We've looked at yeah. stuff from our own perspective enough. 
Um, yes, yeah, we have. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yes, yeah. And I, at the end of the day, I think we, we, I think science can only go so far. I, I'm sorry to say this to any scientist, uh, but you do need that that human element, that philosophical element, absolutely. to try and make to try and put some meaning onto the the other data that 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 has been collected. Absolutely. And that's you know even to like the most religious people that I've talked to, we do come to a point where oh. Well, first of all, for listeners, the Big Bang was not the start of the universe. They don't think that anymore. They never thought that. That was just something they told to make things simple. Um, Because what's one of the first rules of physics? Matter can't be created or destroyed. Right, yeah. Dynamics, yeah. Thermodynamics, yeah. That makes no sense. So that makes no sense. So even science, at a certain point, you have to go, well, what was before that? Oh, well, it was this. Okay, well, what was before that? Well, I I don't know. Yeah. There's there's a point in science, and you know, you and I, I, I dabble in astronomy for fun, but you and I are more focused on humans in a much smaller time span than the billions and trillions of years of the universe. Uh, yeah. So yeah, you're a hundred percent right. Science really does only go so far, and I think people need to understand that because there are researchers that are just data driven. And they miss a lot. I don't want to, (laughs) those. They miss a lot. Um, Yeah. I mean, Neanderthals, if we were still data-driven, besides genetics, we still wouldn't think they interbred with modern humans. I mean, it took... People were writing about that in the 80s, and people laughed at them. You know, Jean All, they laughed at her and said that would never happen. That could never have happened. And not that Clan of the Cave Bears most accurate book series out there, but <laughs> she was right on a few points, you know, like yeah. there was interbreeding. Um which talking about Neanderthals, I think that brings us to our next topic of twenty twenty three, which we learned a lot about Neanderthal cave art in twenty twenty three. I think a lot of yeah. people switch to our side of the argument and i'm definitely going to leave this one up more for you to talk about because not only do you work in this field but and again um let's keep this to what we know you know let's not talk about anything that's coming this is a recap so only stuff that we already know about and why it's important right well i mean i mean really many many respects uh by uh, my 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 reignition of my career started really about three years ago, and um, I, I because I teach and again it's just Seth it's just luck. Mm. Uh, I I I, I happen to be at the University of Bristol for nineteen years. I get moved on because they closed the department down. I then uh, before I moved over to Bristol, I moved then over to um, I, I took a, a, a part time post at uh, the University of uh, Queenborough. Uh, part of their geosciences centre, met uh, some remarkable people, um, uh, and uh, in the meantime, also I had my friends who I've been working with in South America, uh, who were Spanish, and all the stars came together about four years ago when they they decided to create what we call the first art team, and the first art team is what it says on the tin. It's looking for the first art, and really, in many respects, the and the project starts off with a thing called hand pass. And my colleague, uh, Professor uh, Hippolito Calado uh, from Spain, he was looking at, he was particularly interested in handprints. Um, and really there, we, this is when we started to, well, he started to think about the idea about how we can, how can we integrate the science with the philosophy of science, with the philosophy of archaeology, um, and started putting things together, and so he produced a very, very big corpus of material. And then I joined the team about two and a half, three years ago, and uh, so we concentrated on three areas of Spain, um, uh, which was Cantabria, uh, Asturias, and uh, Andalusia. So these were all limestone, limestone areas. Surprise, surprise, and again. Just by looking at the the archaeological record, there's an awful lot of caves there. And in between uh, now and going back to say 15, 20 years ago, the number of cave caves which have yielded uh, Palaitic art 
has been absolutely fantastic. In fact, I don't think there are many caves that don't have Paleolithic art in them. And that's been part of the revolution in many respects. And again, this is really a lovely story for me personally, in that um, about 15, 20 years ago, um, uh, I met a guy called John Harmon who introduced a, a really interesting tool called decorrelation stretch or de stretch. And really, you can't pick up any academic paper now on cave art, which is painted, without someone mentioning about de-stretch and using the de-stretch system. And the de-stretch system is very, very simple. It's a color filtration system, an algorithm, which looks at photographs. So it's, so it's post-site imagery. It then puts it through a color filter system. It teases out the reds, blacks, and yellows that can't be seen with the naked eye. And lo and behold, voila, you've got your rock art. There it is. <laughs> And this has been wonderful. So we found lots and lots of stuff. So, you know, initially, if you picked up any book by Leroy Garan or the Abbey Royale, they show these beautiful horses, beautiful mammoths, bison, elk, reindeer, Lasco, uh, Altamira, and then Chauvet. Fantastic, you know, wonderful stuff. However, we now know that the majority of the rock art we see within the Spain, in the, in, sorry, sorry, the majority of the rock art we see in the, Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, a lot of it is not this pretty stuff at all. It's this tectiforms, spit paintings, handprints. So there's, there's there's almost two types of art going on, but we don't know what we didn't right. know up until quite recently how old that stuff was. And I would also hasten to add as well, there's a very, very important paper which came out about fifteen years ago, which reassessed the dating of some of our favourites, such as Lasco, such as Altamira. Rufinac, etc., etc., and it's now pushed those dates much further back. And again, we have a big problem like we have in the Americas, this pre Clovis idea, in that a lot of um, archaeologists studying that area who are what I would consider, I hate to use this word, old farties, I won't mention who they are, <laughs> uh, but these old farties, they are entrenched in using these stupid names, which I absolutely hate, called the Magdalenian, the Salterin. Um, Etc. Etc. And I just think because they, these are site, these are site based chronologies, which I don't like. So I quite I quite like the idea when we start to, to use scientific dating now, where we use numbers to try and process and characterise this these, these these particular art forms. Because obviously, as we found out, certainly I found out when I did my research on Pavel and K, for example, as I mentioned to you in the last um, program that we did together, um, Pavel and Cave has three lots of dates on the same skeleton and the variation between the three those three dates is sixteen thousand years so initially it was dated to sixteen thousand three hundred or thereabouts in 1964 but by 2009 it had extended itself to about thirty two thousand. Mm. so so this is where we have to be really really careful with the dating system and again what we have to do is every time we update a dating system we have to maybe with some of the more important sites with permission, of course, is get those um, those 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 stratified deposits or the artifacts redated, just to make sure that we are talking about a, for example, a uh, uh, a um, an upper Paleolithic or a middle Paleolithic. Sorry, I start that again. I've been stupid. A late upper Paleolithic or a or a, an early upper Paleolithic material a, 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 a material evidence. So I think it's. It's important to try and keep up to date with those sort of things. Anyway, um, so we got to this. What this? Sorry, Just sorry. Briefly, um, for those, because I, I can see some people wondering, because you mentioned like we might have to redate these sites. Yeah, and that can sometimes be a problem because most of our dating techniques are what we call destructive. Yes, uh, yes, they are. A whatever we're sampling. Let's say you take a piece of paint chip off a cave wall or something. I don't you know, whatever you're doing, a piece of bone, even the most minuscule thing, it gets destroyed to get analyzed. So that's why we're not just dating everything every time a new method comes out because we have to preserve and like you said, we have to ask exactly, yeah, yeah. But also 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 yeah. we can use this we can also reuse the samples that we took. Oh uh, for, for dating, if we're using processes that are non-destructive, there's no reason why we can't use those samples, those original samples, to redate using new technology. And again, just put you in the picture on that one. I did a site recently, um, a Neolithic, a Neolithic site, in fact, where we actually dated the lipids, and this is just absolutely weird. This is we actually dated the lipids of the pottery residues 
uh, the organic lipids and got a date from them. So to, to, to just tell you that sometimes the samples that we're taking are minute anyway. They're yes, yeah, sort of right. gram. Uh, so I, I get that, and it's a very valid, valid point about the idea of destruction because, as we know, archaeology is a process of destruction. It's as simple yes. as that. Yes. So um, anyway, what we've got now, we've got uh, two types of art. We've got beautiful art, exquisite art, uh, which we can tie into roughly uh, a, a period of chronology. Uh, but we also have these wonderful sort of spit patterns, um, uh, also uh, hand stencils, and uh, and also uh, just spreads of 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 saliva and, and and pigment or pigment mixed with saliva across the walls. So it allows us to do DNA, and this is what we've been doing. We've um, been working with a the first art team. We've been working with a a team from the Max Planck Institute, who specialise in nothing but DNA extraction and analysis. And then if we're very, very lucky, the team also has with us, uh, within our group, uh, two people who do um, uranium thorium dating, mm. one from China and one from the UK. And again, this is where the split sampling right. comes into use because we can then make sure that we have a correlation, a correct or a tight correlation of the dates when we are putting these things, to, when we're looking at the interpretation of these particular samples that we're taking. So that's what I've been involved in. We've been doing the Iberian Peninsula. We've done one cave in Portugal and about 40 odd caves in Spain so far. And we're intending to go out and do more sampling at some point. Uh, but the, what we're seeing now is that in a lot of cases, certainly in Spain, and one site I can, I can mention is Morto Leveso, which is in uh, central, uh, central western, western Spain, um, uh, which has been uh, dated using uh, on hand prints in fact as far as i'm aware uh, and they've just they've just done some more dating sampling there ready for analysis but that is one of um, a number of caves which could yield very very early dates indeed of the of, of the potential pigments we've got in there so yeah very interesting stuff really in many respects so that's what we're doing unfortunately as i said to you before in the last program i can't reveal everything because right. it's been it hasn't been published yet, which is annoying, really. But the, certainly the field work is very, very successful. And again, for a guy of my age, I was quite surprised at some of the ways <laughs> I could bend my body in certain positions to get through certain cave uh, passages and, and, and tight squeezes to get into these actual beautiful galleries. And they are remarkable. Right. And I suppose what I'm, for, what I'm fortunate, I think we're all fortunate, very lucky to be doing, we're doing things uh, in those caves which have seen very, very little scientific uh, analysis done on them. Yes, they probably would have been excavated, but probably excavated in the latter part of the 19th century, early part of the 20th century, when science wasn't the issue. It was looking for you know, beautiful big items to, to extract, such as lithics and bone material. And again, I'll just put you to one, one story that I have, is that when I was doing the work at Catol on the, Gat on the Gawa coast, and I, was, I discovered rock art there, I did my research and found out there's a guy called Colonel Wood who'd done the um, excavation there. And this Colonel Wood, bless his cotton socks, had been in every, nearly every bloody cave that I'd been working at in, on the Gower Coast. But what he was basically doing, he was just hoiking out everything to the base of the cave floor oh. uh, without looking at the, str the stratigraphy, and just hoiking it out and just throwing it over onto the spoil heap. And that, because all he wanted to do was to find lithics, big lithics, and big megafauna uh, uh, remains. The rest of it just got thrown away. So there's no environmental evidence. And I, and I get it. It's, you know, he's a product of that time. Uh, right. Just like just like Chris Stringer is a product of his time today. Everything is done very meticulously, and uh, you know, and you know, the full range of science um, apparatus is there for him and his team to work with. Same with for the first art team. You know, whereas before. 50, 60, 70 odd years ago, we'd go in there, record it. We wouldn't actually photograph it. We would draw it. We would have an artist there recreating right. the drawing in colours. And again, the Abbey Royal was a classic example of that. Uh, he did start to use photography in the latter part of his research, but a lot of it was, you know, drawn, sketched work. But now we use the most remarkable photogrammetic techniques known to science uh, to get the maximum amount of information. So, 
how do you do the lighting for the photos? Because I know, like, going on cave tours, like, here in the States, they tell you you can't use flash photography because it could damage the cave. I think that's a bit of a misnomer. We tend to use, uh, I, I've used for a long time, what we call blue lighting. So, as you okay. know, color, color temperature, warm lighting is red, blue lighting is slightly off the, the color spectrum towards the blues. And um, so, if you use red LED lighting, it doesn't emit heat. I think the problem was with uh, in caves today, they don't like they don't like you using flash because I think the flash can have a can create a sort of cytochemical reaction with the color of the pigments, and it's a bit like it's a bit like if I had a a Rembrandt or a or a, a, a or a Picasso in my house, and it was and twelve hours of the day the sun was shining through the window on it, okay. it would fade yeah. away. Or likewise, if you've got a million flashes going off, say in Lascaux, there would have been a million right. flashes over over maybe a 30, 40 year period. That's when you start to get the deterioration. So I, I get that. But we use as, 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 as a scientific rigor I, within our work at first start, we always use blue lighting. Uh, to, so so, so, so it, doesn't, it doesn't emit heat. Uh, which is the most important thing, and also, and more importantly, it it it, it emits a friendly, uh, uh, a light friendly uh, uh, yeah. a, a aspect to to, the, to 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 looking at the cave art. Okay, that makes perfect sense. That makes yeah. Sense. What I do get, what I do get annoyed about, Seth, is and again, another little story is that um, we weren't allowed to use. I wasn't allowed to use flash on engraved art. At Newgrange, I'd say this Newgrange in Ireland, which is a passage grave, near thick passage grave. Right, right. Uh, and, the, and the reason that I was the reason I was given why we weren't allowed to take photographs inside is because it would be uh, it would be wrong uh, because the ancestors will be upset about it. So I get that, but why do they sell postcards of the of the of the art? Yeah, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> I, if they actually stuck by the ancestor thing, I would totally respect it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. If they're selling yeah. postcards. <laughs> Cards, yeah, and you know, and, and I've seen documentaries about it. I've seen it on TV. What's the difference? Uh, yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. It seems to be one rule, rule, one rule for one, one rule for the others. But anyway, that's my little that's my little misery for the for the for the day. <laughs> <laughs> um so one thing that I was thinking about when you were talking about the hands and like trying to figure out if they were Neanderthal or modern Homo sapiens, just that thought, it hit me for the first time of how amazing that is. That you could have a handprint, and we are so similar species-wise, you can't tell if it's a modern human or a Neanderthal just based off of the actual print. I never That's thought correct. about that. Yeah. Like, like, if a Homo naledi made a handprint, you'd know it was a Homo naledi. It looks yeah. the morphology of the hand is different. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and we, we also have the added. We, have, we also have, we also have the added problem as well, Seth, which I've got to mention is that you know as time has moved on, we've started to push back the dates now for modern humans. So right. you know, so for example, you know, we have in in the British Isles, we have a place called Kent's Cavern, which is down in the south. Mm -hmm. Part of Britain, right on the coast, the the coast of the English Channel, uh, overlooking. So you get keep you keep on going south, you'll hit France. And at Kent's Cavern, we had a date there. I, I think around about thirty three thousand for the earliest modern human to come into the the British Isles. Um, Which is on the whole other side of you know the world from Africa. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but but you know, so we have, but we have dates of modern humans in Israel. In the in the in the Levant, uh, which are up to ninety thousand, right? And, and, and that's that's the problem. It, you know, the more we push back the the dates of modern humans, the more difficult it is to produce that argument to say that at a cutting off point, i.e., in Spain, forty thousand twenty right. years ago, uh, everything before forty thousand could be Neanderthal. Everything before after forty thousand is more exactly. than likely modern human. We're now pushing that back. So, for example, we've got dates, and I think I could say this, because we've got dates of 60,000, I think, in Monteverso, in uh, Monteverso Cave in uh, central, West Port, uh, central West Spain. Um, so, again, the question, you, I, I'll ask the question, is it Neanderthal or is it modern human? We don't know. And again, I think this is, where, this is why we are working with the Max Planck team, trying to understand the DNA, because 
hopefully, um, I can't reveal anything at the moment, but hopefully one or two of the caves we've been looking at, maybe some of the residues from, from the fingers of Neanderthals are on that pigment. And maybe we can start saying something quite meaningful about who is making the art. I still am... What were we about to say? That's my question. I was going to say, I'm still team, team Neanderthal, by the way. Okay. <laughs> um, so you were mentioning that there seems to be like two types of art going on. We have the beautiful art, and then we have more like engravings, geometric yeah. signs. Yeah. From what I know, I would assume Homo sapiens did both. But do you think the Neanderthals would only be more engravings? Or do you think they were more capable of some other I, more things as well? I have two theories, and I, I hope people listening to this will have a good argument with me about it. My first argument is that when there was contact between modern humans and Neanderthals, and let's, let's, let's not put a date on it, but it's right. happening very, very early. I think it's happening very, very early indeed. In a lot of different places around the world. In, around, Ex the old, yeah. around, around, the around the Neanderthal world. Uh, and there's one or two things going on there. Either there's mimicry going on between Neanderthals and uh, modern humans, whereby modern humans are learning from Neanderthals, or Neanderthals are learning and mimicking modern humans in terms of their art forms. That's one point. And the other point as well, we're talking about vast areas of time. So let's just put this in context. If we think about the idea that we have three generations of family over 100 years, that's 30 per thousand years. If we are looking at 10,000 years, we're looking at 300 generations of people. And in that time, it could be the case that there's a trend. and We see trends within our own world. You know, right. we, had, we adopted Coca-Cola, Levi jeans in the 1950s. 40s, yeah, 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, before that, we were very, very bland in our tweed trousers and our very, very conservative <laughs> lifestyle. But we adopted Americanization. And that's mm -hmm. in one, that's just, just in one generation. And now mm -hmm. we've got the tech med generation going on now. So in my lifetime, I've witnessed two major revolutions in material culture in my, in my world. Well, likewise, I think over maybe 300 generations of community, there was a point when um, figurative rock art was in. So you got your horses, you got your bisons, and, or, and, and remember that only part of those animals are being uh, are being uh, painted or engraved. And then at some point, they phase out. We start to get this idea of of stylization and geometric uh, uh, for, uh, cr the creation of geometric patterns on these cave walls. And again, the argument is, well, you know, at Lasco, you've got your horse there, and you've got your, your bison there, but you've got this tectiform or this triangle or this thing there. It's obviously all one event. Well, not necessarily. It could right. be the case it's happened over many, many generations, and maybe you know, new or earlier artists are making it simple for themselves. And maybe the idea of this, I quite like the term, um, again, forgive, me, forgive anybody who's listened to me before, restricted visual access. The more information you hold to yourself, the more powerful you become. If you yeah. start to give away all the secrets of the art, then there's a problem. To make that more difficult for people to understand your art, so you can only trickle out certain elements of that, and we see it within our world religions today, um, then you are more powerful. So I think that what you've got at some point within uh, the history of a cave, um, over one of those 300 generations, 30,000 years, You've got your art being produced, which is representative. You, can, you and I can go in there and say, oh, that's a horse, uh, because it looks like a horse. It's drawn like a horse. It is a bloody horse. Uh, but when we are looking at ge geometric forms, and this is the stuff that Genevieve was, has been working on a lot over the last four or five years, um, and uh, actually more than that, the last 10 years, um, then it's, it's a new type of ball game. And I think it's to do with the idea of of maybe you know uh, maybe there's a, you know, there's a there's a there's uh, a a problem in society, uh, you know I, you know where you've got political and ideological change, and that political ideological change forces people to rethink the way they tell stories, and this is what it's all about telling stories. And I was once again it's a lovely story. Um, I was with a guy called Richard Bradley, um, who's a very famous British archaeologist. Again, we were in Northern Ireland. It was a, it was a beautiful site called Loch Loch Crew. 
which is uh, in the same area as New Grange and Nowth and Douth on the Boyne Valley. It's a passage grave. And he said, it's a, and it's just a lovely story, he said, he thinks that the idea of the artist, the artist is, is an intermediary between the powers which are in the stone who are telling them stories. So it's almost like a shamanistic ideology, whereby the stone is talking to the artist and that the artist is conveying the messages or some of the messages onto an audience who is watching the art either being produced or being you know, uh, touched up, painted up uh, over a long period, maybe over many generations. But nonetheless, the, the stone, the artist is the intermediary between the public, that's you and I, the audience, and the actual sacred object itself, which is the stone on which the paint or the engraving is on. And I think that's, again, it's an interesting point to consider when we think about how we interpret rock art per yeah. se. Yeah, that's a very interesting take because if we're going into the spiritual aspect of cave art, which a lot of people believe, and I don't know really, I don't think there's really evidence, but it's easy to believe that when you go into these deep, dark caves, there's some shaman painting on the wall and, you know, they're getting smoke inhalation. There might be on mushrooms or something. Something's going on. There could be a whole spiritual aspect. So to think that maybe, yes, that, that it could have been something like that, I think could easily be, you know, knowing what I know about human psychology, Again, yeah, you're right. You know, the more that you know that other people don't is the more power you have. The more power you have, the more people follow you. And if you can show that you're commuting with the spirits in this way and positive things are happening to the community because of it, you know, then that's kind of how that builds on to forming. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, we, we, we can, we, we're, we're sadly very divorced from what was right. going on 40 odd thousand years ago. That's, this is a big problem. You know what they were producing, and, I, and again, there's another philosopher that I I look up to, a guy called Christopher Tilly, who said that the idea, and this again makes me think about it in some respects, is that if we are looking at a horse, we're looking at a bison. Is it a horse, or is it a bison, or is it something completely different? And again, to put that into context, I was working with another guy called Christopher Chippendale, uh, who was a Cambridge scholar. Uh, we did a lot of work together, but he was working in Australia, and he was once talking to a big man uh, of a, of a tribal community who was in charge of doing the painting. And basically, they are retouching very mm. ancient paintings uh, to bring them up to date, to continue the narrative, the storytelling, to that generation of people. And he just said to this guy, he said, my goodness me, it's a beautiful crocodile you've painted up there on that wall. And he said, it's not a crocodile, it's a kangaroo. But then you look at it, and you think, well, hang on a minute, it's got a big, 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 big jawline. It's got a long body, a long tail, and four legs. It's a crocodile. It looks like a crocodile. He said, ah, it was a crocodile, but now it's a kangaroo. And the point is that when you're doing a narrative, unless you are doing a series of cartoons, which you can't do in Abor Aboriginal Australian art, it has to be on one canvas, then you have to tell part of the story, but maybe elaborate that story by singing, chanting, storytelling, around that one image that once it was a kangaroo so once it was a crocodile but now it's turned into a kangaroo and vice versa of course and that's how you do your study and also more importantly it's how you keep the power of you being the big man or the big woman who's telling that story that is fascinating you know i for being so much of the bio anthropologist that i am i <laughs> cultural anthropology is well I came like a class away from getting a BA in cultural anthropology and then some stuff happened and now I'm going for my BA in bio Um, but I mean, you know, Australian rock art because Australians in general have one of the oldest continued cultures, you know, Aboriginal yep, Australia. Living traditions. Yeah. Uh, 60, 70,000 years old. Uh, we have Mungo man in Australia. What is 65 thousand i think yeah uh, a very very ritualized burial um he had red ochre all over him he was buried he was in a certain position indigenous australians have known what they've been doing for a very long time so hearing that and that's how they view rock art you would have to assume since humans are all so similar mm, that yeah. that could be applied yeah. elsewhere and that is yeah 
truly changes how I think and view all rock art. I mean, mm. like, cause yeah, that, that's a, that's a horse that even looks like the horses that are roaming around Russia right now, a step horse. Mm. But what if it's not? I mean, you're right. What if we're looking at, again, the theme for this season, we're looking at it through our eyes, but we're not the painters. We didn't make it. Yeah. 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 If well, it, so- yeah. You wrote a book. You've written multiple books. I can read your book and I can retell it to other people, but I'm not going to know what you meant when you wrote it exactly. No, no, no. Well, that, again, that's the, the beauty, the beauty is that the, the eye of the, the reader or the beholder in many respects. Right. And and I think this is a wonderful thing. If we, if we want to take this, take, take this discussion further, which I hope we do in the series, let's look at modern art. Let's look at abstract art, you know, surrealism, Dada. Um, these are all uh, art forms uh, which have you know very very strange meanings to them, but a lot of people can't really get their heads around. Uh, but who's to say there isn't a Dadaism or a surrealism going on in prehistoric rock art, and I'm sure there is in many respects. I mean, there, it's, there's, a, there's a series of patterns which are going right through the, the prehistoric world worldwide, which are all synchronous. They're all happening at the same, roughly the same sort of time, and happening to usually, they're, 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 they're usually the result of changes in material culture, which we can argue are the result of changes in ideology, political, social, and economic, and they are, are having an influence on a a, a a a a a a group a, a community um, who are making these forced changes in some respects. So again, it's just an interesting point to consider when we are looking back. Because again, remember we have that divorce between us now and those people then. And I think Cliff, Chris Chippendale and Paul Tayson did a really good book in 1998. And in their opening chapter, they talked about the idea of, and I love it. I really do love this. They call it informed uh, methods. And informed methods are the methods of the anthropologists, whereby they stand there, watch the graffiti artist, or watch the uh, the, the the big man in Australia, Northern Australia, and they ask, "Why are you doing it?" And therefore, we have a direct answer about why they're doing it. Uh, but then we also have what we call formal methods, which they in- include, in which they use. And formal methods are basically the formalization of interpretation through archaeology and ethnography rather than the informed methods used by anthropologists. So again, there's an interesting point. And in within that formal method, we have the hard science, which we are now embracing as archaeologists. Right. Well, I think, you know, when we're talking about hard science and things like that, it might be a good time to bring up some hard science that is being done in Rising Star. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we we want to. So this this podcast, you know, it's it's a recap of twenty twenty three. We're almost two hours long. It's the longest episode we've done. I think this will be our last story, and then we'll get into some book reviews. Yeah, and yeah. Then we can talk about the future a bit. Um, but I think you know, guys. I don't know about you. I hope you've been listening this long. I'm having a blast. I hope George is having fun. I think this is going really well. I think we already have a flow going. So, you know, if if you like what's going on, make sure to leave a comment down below. If you think we could change something up, maybe add more jokes, be a little more free, or you want us to talk more about specifically what we're doing, then just let us know in the comments. Because we're going to talk about Home and Aladdy now, and this might upset some of you. So. <laughs> <laughs> so... Let me start with, for anyone who has not seen my video that I put up this week on my opinions on Homo Naledi, I encourage you to watch it, because I have not before that shared my opinions. I have reported on what was going on, both from Lee's team and then the peer reviews, and then I sat quietly and let people handle the information. So I came up with my opinions, which are based on, I have friends from the original team that live near me actually now, um, that I talk to. I have been in very constant communication with Dr. Hawks, Dr. Fuentes. Lee is not my biggest fan right now. Um, so we'll, we'll see where that goes, but I used to talk to Lee a lot and just a lot of members of the team. So I have a pretty good idea of what, what's going on, even things that are unannounced. And 
Rising Star has just been literally the most fascinating thing in Taylor anthropology to me, not only this year, but in the last decade. Rising Star and what it could represent is mind boggling to me. Now, you've been in Rising Star. I get it. In any cave that I go to, I, I love being in. I just get this feeling of warmth and care of being underground. But I always imagine that being in Rising Star is just different than any other cave. I, I don't have experience in many caves, but I just feel like, to me, there would almost be a spiritual sense to it. Like, you feel like you're entering a zone that maybe you Maybe you shouldn't be in. I don't know. That's how I've always felt like it. And maybe that's because of how humanized Lee has made Homo Naledi, and now they are calling it a burial ground, and, you know. And now they're saying they did art. And that they had fires. You know, we've talked about it. You went down a skeptic. You've come up, not convinced, I'd say, but maybe thinking differently, at least. Yes, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I agree with you on that front. I, I, I went down as a skeptic only because um, of the constraints that I could see within the evidence, and the evidence was basically you're looking at a small brain hominin. Right. Um, what is really interesting again is again it's what we've just briefly talked about this idea about contact between Neanderthals and modern humans yes. about yes. mimicry. Um, it'd be interesting to know outside Rising Star. Um, what evidence there is for Naledi, and I'm sure there probably is in other cave systems within that area. Remember, it's, it's a very, very busy area for, for cave yeah. ar potential cave archaeology. So I believe that in the, you know, in the near future, in the, last, in, the, sorry, in the next 10, 20 years, hopefully more Naledi will be found. And that will help us to, to concrete once yeah. and for all that we are dealing with a species, for one thing, and that species had some our concept of all the things you've talked about burial for example and making fire which is again a conceivable idea but again i went down uh rising star before my dad rising star I was very skeptical about that problem about the issue of of uh, of of of, uh, of burial and making fire and um um then when the art thing broke um that sort of raised my eyebrows even more so really because as far as i was concerned and again if i sat here 30 years ago i'd be saying of course, there's only modern humans who are making art, certainly not Neanderthals, but that doesn't <laughs> seem to be the case anymore. You know, we've only got to see, you know, the famous caves at Shanidar, for example, in northern Iraq, or the or, or what's been going on in Mount Carmel in Israel. We haven't touched that this this for this uh, series, sorry, this particular episode. But yeah, I'll, we, talk, I'll, talk about, I'll talk. I'll talk. I'll talk about another day, another day, because it, it is really interesting. And um, but anyway, um, the. Uh, when we when the word art was mentioned, I was very skeptical. I still am skeptical about it. I must admit. I mean, it depends what we mean by art. And again, I've been very careful with certainly. I've, we've had to produce a report for Lee, and I've I've used the word markings, and I've put in brackets for want of a better term, because <laughs> because because again, we have to be very careful about this this idea about humanising a hominin. Uh, and you know the idea of, of of a hominin making art is a big big ask, a big right. thing to say, and so I've been very careful. I've called it markings or marks, um, and I have my my ideas, and I think I gave some ideas about what might be going on in that cave system. Uh, what I can say, as I said to you before, in one of the entrances leading into the cave, there's an Iron Age site there, definitely an Iron Age site. But remember, the big problem is that all three entrances that I went into. They've been heavily truncated and 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 messed around with by uh, by the mining industry um, in the latter part of the nineteenth century, early part of the twentieth century. So that there's a big issue there. You know how much evidence has been destroyed within those entrance areas? Because as you well know, where there has been very very good excavation in cave sites per se, irrespective of where you are in the world, you've got the cave which is divided into usually two spaces: public space. And private space, mm -hmm. and the private space is really down in the the bowels of that cave. The public space is usually around the entrance, where they can, where they have visuality of the landscape, uh, where they can do the cooking, where they can do their sleeping, 
uh, and, 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 and live a public life. But as you go further deep into that cave, that's when you start to get the private space. So we've lost a lot of the potential archaeological evidence, really, for Naledi modern humans, uh, right through right through to the you know, to the, the the latter part of prehistory. Um, and so I, I think there's a big issue. There's a lot of question marks still to be asked. Uh, so sorry, a lot of question marks being raised, and a lot more questions to be asked about what is going on with Rising Star itself. I suppose the other thing as well is that the accessibility, um, the accessibility now is not too bad. And I'm talking from a, a very old man. Uh, I think I'm the, I think I'm the oldest. I think I'm the oldest man in the world to be. Yes, yeah, so right. I am the oldest man to actually venture as a scientist inside Rising Star. I think. That's an accomplishment. Uh, I'll, just, I'll, I'll just whisper in your ear. I'm, I'm 64. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm 64 years old. Uh, so I, 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 qualify, I qualify the Guinness Book of Records of being the oldest <laughs> party to go into the Rising Star Cave. Uh, but the point is, it's the accessibility. Accessibility now is better than it was, uh, but there are still still problems. And I still argue that for Naledi, it would have been relatively easy to get through as as a single hominin going through that cave system. But if you are dragging a corpse with you, because there are burials down there, uh, or in ter- I, again, I use the I use the word very very carefully. I didn't call them burials because that means digging a hole. Right. I call them in- interments. Uh, um, there's 15 odd interments down there plus, and those interments had to be dragged in from somewhere. Now, again, my argument will be if I'm if I'm being really sceptic, I would say well, obviously there's another entrance into the cave, probably from above. You know, because in yeah. limestone past areas, you get these swallets or these sinkholes, and they easily get blocked. It get covered over with soil, and then before you know it, it, it you know it's it, the the whole evident idea of evidence coming through a hole from the top has been lost. So there's always that argument to to, to, to be sort of uh, followed through, and I don't think that's been followed through just yet. Uh, but let's assume there wasn't sinkholes or swallets. You'd have to crawl through that cave in a particular way. Then it'd be very difficult to, to drag a, a a deceased through that cave. And then inter it into the into the Deladi uh, chamber, and so there thereby goes is one of my sceptical sceptical issues. Uh, but they must have done it because the archaeological evidence is down there. It's yeah, just piecing it together. It's piecing it together, and I think also more importantly with the art thing. Um, I'm pleased. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm deeply honoured that Lee has asked us to go down there uh, because I think that the the problem needs to be ver- it needed verification, and we've now provided some answers to his 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 questions. Not the not the skeptics questions, but to his questions that he asked us to, to look at. So I, I'm I'm more than pleased about the outcome of our first the, the first uh, project we did down there, which was about two months ago, three months ago, was basically to look at uh, the potential. And this is the important word: the potential for Brock art. He called it Brock art. I call it markings, uh, engraved marks uh, within the cave. And could they be tied tied to the Lady or an early modern human, for example? And we've answered that question in many respects. I can't give that result out yet because it's only fair that Lee probably does that for himself. Uh, but uh, I was very pleased about what we saw down there, and I get what you say about this idea about, about the idea about you know, these cave. To, to us as modern humans going down there it's a very very special place and i will say that with all the caves that i've been down and i've i've uh, done about about 90 to about 90 to 100 caves in my career mm. but properly properly and it's the first cave that i felt it's so like special it's special partly because of this continuous history it has it has a very very early prehistoric history which is naledi it also has i think a a prehistory as well with mod- early mock humans. It has a later prehistory with the Iron Age, and then also it has a potential, oh, no, not potential, it has a, an actual physical evidential history of the mining industry being down there. And that's all part of the narrative, the part of the narrative of the cave. So uh, you, get, you go through different sensations. And I think another thing as well, working with uh, people, the, 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 the people who are with us, um, the, the people who weren't archaeologists but who were there to do the guiding and to do to to go through the health and safety with us um 
that was an experience in itself as well because um, we realised as as archaeologists and as paleoanthropologists, it wasn't just a case of going down there and get on with it. You needed yeah. that yeah. that knowledge, that that special knowledge. Like again, that ritual knowledge. The idea of knowledge is power. You know, you look up to these people um, to 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 guide you through the cave safely, and they were very very good in, in making sure that every step we took in a in a potentially dangerous place, we took the right step and not the wrong step, or it would have resulted in injury. So. Um, and I, I, and again, I'm proud to say that there was one particular part of the cave called the twisty turny section, which I wouldn't do. <laughs> I might do it next, I might do it next time, but I won't do it now. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so at the moment, you know, still, uh, I still, we still have that question about, uh, I'm going to give Lee the respect that he deserves. He will, um, hopefully he'll call us back. We're hoping to be there sometime in late January to do some more work but this, with this time it'd be sampling and also more uh my, my new tie of the hard science i mean the one thing i like to do which we haven't talked about yet is to probably uh test it test the some of the the engravings which are under style flow for dna analysis for example right. and do, do some of the dna on the sediments but i think some of that's already been done but i haven't seen results of that yet it's good because it, because i suppose because of the the massive interest that's been scientific interest that's been on this particular cave site. Um, there's so many papers floating out. I think there's about 80 odd papers floating around the academic academic ether. Uh, and again, it's just time of getting them, downloading them, reading them. It's just time right. is not on my side. So we were there for a Pacific job, and the Pacific job was verification. But within that verification process, because of our, I suppose, our in tuned eyes looking for rock art or markings, we found those markings. And we've got about eight sites. I dare say if we went down there again, I th would suggest we find more. So, so I know you're leaving the answer for Lee, and that's respectable, and that's fine. But let me just try to understand maybe more what the question was. Was yeah. he trying to find if they were anthropogenic versus natural? Was that the big question? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Basically, With, because uh, because as you uh, as you well know, the geology of the cave is elephant skin dolomite, right? And the word elephant skin tells you that we've got these natural striations going that way horizontally, vertically, curvilinear left and right, uh, and also diagonal lines as well. So they create all sorts of patterns. And again, again, it's like an ink spot pattern to a psychologist. You look hard enough, you can see Margaret Thatcher or Ronald Reagan in it somewhere. Right. Okay, so, uh, so the first thing we did, our first test was to test the dolomites. We knew what they were, what it was. We knew it was natural the dolomite geology. So we tested it by looking at uh, under under um, uh, uh, a, a portable microscope the grooves. So if the grooves were V shaped, we know it's of of hominid agency. If it's curvilinear, then we know it's natural. And so that was our first, our first control point was to look at that. And then we looked at some modern graffiti to prove that modern graffiti was actually V-shaped, and it was. Right. So we've got those two control points to look at when we look at some of the stuff that, uh, that Lee will show us. We've seen some of it already, but we right. haven't seen the bulk of it. When we see the bulk of it, we were able to tell him yes or no if that's natural or otherwise. Okay. That makes but, there are some, but there are some potential candidates which suggest that it is of hominin agency i'm not saying human agency i'm saying hominin agency i'm keeping again i'm keeping an open mind of that until we get in our grubby hands a bit of scientific dating from a style flow and, and do a minimum date uh, then i I'm, I'm again i'm being very careful about how i word my answers absolutely as i think we all should and Something that maybe hasn't happened so much with Rising Star lately. They, you know, they used to be so careful with their wording, and I think they need to kind of go back to being a little more cautious with. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the term art, I think, is a, a very, very ambiguous word. And if 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 if, um, if the team is looking at the idea of art being markings, then I get it. I just wouldn't use the term art. I would say markings. Um, right, and. Right. And also, and again, this is—I'll say this. I think I'll say this publicly, but I, I probably would have called in some rock art specialists like our team in um, quicker, sooner rather than right. later. Uh, but 
I, honestly, like, frankly, uh, after seeing this, the uh, images and seeing that they were geometric signs, I immediately thought of Genevieve and thought, huh, why hasn't Lee asked Genevieve to come look at these yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Gene- <laughs> Genevieve did, did approach, I think, I think yeah. she approached him and he thought it was a good idea. And I think it was, I think it's been good for him to do yeah. that because, um, again, we know what, well, I like to say, think that we know what we're, talk- what we're talking about. But I'll just give you one little story, Seth, with yeah. to me. Back in my early career, um, working as a, you know, I, well, I consider myself to be a rock art specialist. I was up in a uh, up on a coastal site up in northern England uh, in in a, in, a, in a place called Lancashire, and in Lancashire there's a, there's the famous Blackpool Leisure Beach, there's Lancaster of course, and there's a beautiful place called Morecambe Bay, and it's a really wonderful, wonderful sort of. And it's got a wonderful history. I mean, not prehistory, but the history. And I saw on this rock a series of uh, concentric circles. And um, this is, and this, and this again, this is just a word of warning for anybody who does what we have to do. Is and I sort of reported them. I said, "Oh, look, we got about seven or eight uh, concentric circles here. Obviously, Bronze Age, because this is what you get." And I again, although you uh, listeners can't see, but it was like that. So, okay, okay, okay. So these were concentric circles, allegedly carved into the rock. Uh, I went there one day, and I was about to send the email saying, Dear uh, uh, Historic Environment Record, we have here at this particular point, grid reference, bloody, 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 blah, a series of eight concentric circles, uh, uh, which are classically Bronze Age. Therefore, we've got a Bronze Age rock art site. I went back there next morning and had a really good look at them, and I found out it was lichen. <laughs> so the lichen has formed a series of patterns. <laughs> like, of course, if I had re- reported that, my career, my career would have been over and done with. I'd have to go. <laughs> I'd have to start studying iconography and snails or something like that. But uh, yeah, but it just tells you. Just tells you. Yeah, about, about uh, when you start to look at things, you look at things hard enough, you'll see some patterns. I'm mean. afraid. And I'm afraid, Mother Nature. She's a cl- she's a very very clever person in fooling us people. To suggest that we've got some f- some form of artistic tradition or some sort of artistic expression on a rock when it actually isn't. It's actually something which is natural, and I've fallen through it. I've fallen through it. That's one one time, and then another time I fell for it with hematite because I I didn't realise that the hematite was actually a secreted hematite rather than a, than applied hematite. And again, one thing we've got in Rising Star now is applied hematite, which is very very exciting because we do know that this, that was done by hominin agency in inverted commas so that is very exciting so um but again we don't know how old that is yet but uh, but again well, hopefully when we go back there in january we'll be armed and ready for because we are taking with us we're taking with us a two people who are specialists in pigment analysis we're taking a one of those guys is a also did his phd in geology i know it because i examined it and um so we we, yeah, we are going with a team which is a multidisciplinary team and we'll be able to make some make some more sense of what is going on down there we won't have the answers all the answers right but right can, but but we can do this I, I hate to use that term but we can do a tick box tick, tick box exercise is it human agency or hominid agency tick right or not cross uh, so we'll be able to go through those processes and work out what might be going on but by our preliminary investigations into that cave system suggests that it, first of all that the art or the markings are not confined just to the Delandy chamber or rising star chamber or dragon's back chamber it's applying through the whole bloody cave system so you could go through all those entrances there are little bits of evidence to suggest that we have little markers i like to call them markers whereby hominins are going into that cave system and they're looking at these markers and that's guiding you through the cave because as i said if we had gone down that cave system by ourselves, we would still be there, <laughs> lost and for, lost and forgotten. Anyway, I think I've talked enough about the lady. <laughs> um, and just to clarify uh, for listeners, we are still hominids, Homo sapiens. Homo yeah. sapiens are still hominids. So when George is saying hominin agency, he's not saying like, oh well, if it wasn't Naledi, it wasn't Neanderthal. No, it's it's either Naledi or Homo sapiens, practically yeah. at, at this yeah. point. So yeah, basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I think that does a great job of summarizing kind of the new stuff going on with Letty and what's happening in the future. And, you know, we're now that we're doing this podcast together, I think people can look forward to staying up to date with the rock art going on yeah, yeah. as much as you could talk about um, at Rising Star. So now I know to round off this um, recap, you wanted to talk about some of your favorite books of the year. Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing I do, Seth, I, I, one of the pleasures of um, of my life is I don't pay for books. <laughs> I get a lot of I books sent to me. I am familiar, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, get, I, I, um, so I, 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 I work for, um, I do a, a reviews for Current World Archaeology and Current Archaeology, which okay. are two British, two British magazines, and I'm sure that I think there's an equivalent in the US. Uh, but uh, yeah. when it comes to rock art, they're very, very, they're very kind. They just say, "Would you mind reviewing this?" And the reviews are usually very, very short. They're usually two hundred, about two hundred words, sometimes three hundred words, and sometimes, if you're a good boy, it's six hundred words. And so this year, I've reviewed thirty-eight books, and I've got um, a sort of a handful of books with me now, which I consider to be, I suppose, my best buys if I was buying them. Uh, 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 the H one in the description. Yes, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll do. Yeah, but I hate to be, I hate to be sort of self publicist. Two of the books belong oh, to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, published actually published um, this year, late this year, but actually it's got the publishing date is two thousand and twenty four. It's the prehistoric rock art of Portugal, uh, symbolising on animals and things. And that's been edited by myself and Sarah Garcia, who's a very good colleague of mine. And again, I, Seth, I would like to get her really for a, for an interview for your um, your 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 um, your paleoanthropology program at some point in the future. She's a very very good speaker. And the book basically covers the the prehist the prehistory of rock art or the prehistoric rock art of Portugal from the Coa Valley, the Palithic stuff, the Palithic stuff. Right through to a scoral, which is the only uh, pathic cave with art in Portugal, uh, to the Iron Age. So it's a it's a comprehensive book written by some really wonderful scholars. Um, I had the pleasure of obviously because I was editing it, reading through it, and getting rid of all the Spanglish and Portuguese <laughs> in it. Uh, but once it was done, it was a wonderful book, and it's a a good book. But if you're going to buy it, wait because at the moment it's in hardback. Mm. And in terms of American dollars, it's about $150 per book. But that will go down to around about $40 if it's produced in paperback. So don't buy that yet. Uh, the next book, um, which I think is, an, a, 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 though I would say so myself, it's, um, it's um, edited by Aaron Maisel and myself. Uh, this is about British rock art. It's called uh, Signaling and Performance, Ancient Rock Art in Britain and Ireland. And again, it's taking the reader through a series of papers done by eminent, eminent um, rock art specialists in the British Isles who are taking it from the Paleolithic right through to the Iron Age. And again, some real lovely papers in there, really wonderful papers. Um, and that, so I would recommend. So those are the two big uh, hard sells by myself. Coming back to reality, um, <laughs> the one book, I re one book I really did enjoy uh, reading, and I think it's volume one of maybe two or three, is a book called Europe's Lost Frontiers. Mm. And it, it's all about the context and methodology engaged by uh, Vince Gaffney, who's a very good friend of mine, and Simon Fitch, who uh, edited a book on uh, the, the Doggerland, the land that's mm. now below the North Sea. Right. And it's a really very good read. If you like hard science and you know, some of, the, some of the, uh, the, uh, the techniques they're using to map uh, Doggerland, its extent. And again, just to put you in the picture for those who don't know, 6,500 BC or 8,500 years ago, there was a big landmass between the British Isles and Europe. Uh, and because of Brexit, the, uh, the, the landmass sank below the sea within 500 years. And by 6,500 BC, the North Sea had, 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 had formed. So under that, there is a wonderful landscape not just a geomorph geomorphological landscape, but a landscape which was occupied by humans. So a lot of Mesolithic hunter-gatherer sites there. And um, the clue is that each year, uh, Doggerland or a dog, uh, do Dogger Bank, which is a, a large fishing bank, is dredged. And when it's dredged, it 
brings up lithics, it brings up decorated bone and antler, and this is where I got interested, because in the early 1990s, as part of my master's in Phil, I did a project on decorated bone and antler from Scandinavia, mm. southern Scandinavia, and I used Doggerland, some of the stuff that's found in Doggerland, as part okay. of my discussion point. That's a right riveting read. I think it's around about £35, so about $40 to buy. And then, um, uh, just two more books to look at. Um, there's a, a guy who I was, I actually um, examined his PhD, a guy called uh, Dario Segli, Italian guy. He is 2.2 metres high. He's a big, tall lad. He should be a basketball player, not an archaeologist. Uh, but his passion is rock art, and he did his PhD on the Upper Palatic rock art sites of Italy. And believe, mm. it, believe me, they do exist. Uh, he has identified about 20 of them in this book. It's a really lovely book. And um, uh, again, I think it's in English. Uh, it is. It's in English. And so, uh, again, it's, a, it's a, a book which is very readable. It's basically his PhD, but I've, he was asked to rewrite it by me and, he, and his other examiners. And he's produced a really good book, full colour throughout, uh, beautiful mm. photography, and looks at the, you know, the context, the geology, the landscape, the geomorphology, the archaeology surrounding it. Plus the rock art sites. So, the, so again, there's a Palatic um, tradition going on in Italy. And it's something which was actually identified by Leroy Goron in 1965 when he did his big map of Europe and he was concentrating on the Dordogne and obviously obviously the uh, uh, northern Spain, the Franco Frank Cantabrian areas. But missing from that from that uh, corpus was the Coa Valley, of course, in Portugal, the stuff which is found in nearly every major river valley in Portugal and Spain, and also the stuff in Italy. I think he mentions about one site in Italy, but uh, obviously what's turned up since then, since 1965, is a good 20-odd sites or more which have rock art on them. And then finally, um, the two, there's two volumes. Again, I'm not sure. This is, this is in Spanish. I'm not quite sure of the price, uh, but two hardback, hardback books. And basically, it's the report on the art of the 60 that were found in the Monte de Vesto uh, cave which is in central western Spain. Again, beautifully, lavishly uh, 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 illustrated throughout. And again, going into the minutiae uh, of, the, of, of, the, of, of, the, of the cave and its, and its archaeology and its context. And then, if you don't mind, I'll just say one more thing, Seth. Um, for those of you are, who are mad on antiquarian books, mm. go on to Amazon, go on to Amazon and just check out, if you can, if it's a, a favourite archaeologists of the 1920s, 1930s, whatever, who produced a, a, a fantastic book, it's more than likely that you can get in a, in a facsimile. And most of my, my, my antiquarian collection are facsimile books. And the one book I got this year, it's a very, very simple book, it's been leather bound, uh, cost me, I think, around about £32. Pounds. Um, and this is Dorothy Garrard's book. Again, one of the, the hero I was talking about earlier okay. on. And, and she wrote a book called, uh, and I've got it here, I have to write, The, the Upper Palatic Age of, in Britain by Dorothy Garrard, 1926. And in there, she covers everything to the minute detail about what was found in the caves in terms of Palatic. Nothing wow. about rock art, right. but a lot about the paleo, the Palatic uh, artifacts that came out of these caves. And again, it's just a wonderful book, really good value for those of you who, are, who like uh, the Palatic art, or no, sorry, sorry, the Palatic age of the British Isles at that point in time, what people were thinking in the 1920s. They published in 1926. That's my book review for 2023. You know, what would be a great idea, especially if maybe you want to talk about a book per episode that we do or something? Yeah, by me, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to be uh, doing a, a really good book on, on, the, um, on polar, on polar archaeology. Oh, that would uh, be interesting. So I could do that for ne the next one, yeah. And I'm just, I'm, but I'm yeah, thinking I'll... maybe, and I, I don't, exp I know you probably can't use the one you submit to the magazine, but maybe for my website, for our listeners, you can do a different quick little review so they can... Yeah, yeah, no problem at all, no problem at all, no problem, no problem, no problem at all. I mean, in fact, I, I could have a word with the magazine to see if they'd be willing to... Me, right, because right. Because obviously... Good publicity is good publicity, and um, if it yeah, yeah. promotes uh, the uh, the the you know the, the, the magazine and right. also your website, then fair enough. I, I don't see a problem with that. 
Awesome, because I think that would help the listeners a lot, because you're talking about these books, and I know it's a little easier for me because I'm seeing them, but just sitting here listening, and even with the links, I mean, I can see people wanting to know more, so I think that would yeah, be fair. Yeah, no problem at all, yeah. I, what I'll do is I'll upload the links for all those books um, in the next couple of days for, for you. Awesome. So, brilliant. so, you know, guys, 2023 has been a crazy year. We came out with the Paleo Post podcast. We had a 10 episode season one. I think you guys really enjoyed it. According to AI, you guys did. Uh, Google Bard says it was pretty popular, so I don't know. But uh, I'm hoping with this recap of 2023 and our introduction of our new co-host, Dr. George Nash, we are really starting a new path here that a lot of you will join us on. And again, this was an extra long episode because we're doing a recap. Episodes are normally an hour long, and they will be weekly unless we decide to do bi-weekly. But I think for right now, it'll stay the same. And you can catch up on the latest news in paleoanthropology, as well as rock art, cave art, and and. Now that George is here, maybe just some of the awesome stories that he's experienced, because we want to bring some diversity to the show and something to listen to that you guys just, whether you're driving home from work or you've just had a long day and you want to learn about anthropology, we're here for you. We've got you. And we are here with the Paleo Post podcast. And with that, I will say that I am signing off and I will leave it to George. I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of 2023. You'll probably see me in a few more videos before the end of the year. But for the podcast, this is it. This is it for 2023. We'll see you in 2024. Dr. Nash, is there anything you'd like to say on your first episode of the Paleo Post podcast? Just, just two very, very quick things, Seth is that sometimes the archaeology or the history of the archaeology is as important as the archaeology itself. So some of, the, some of the, the characters that I've had to work with and some of the people that you've probably had to work with can tell you stories about their experiences, some of their negative experiences and some, certainly some of their positive experiences. And again, I've just really today just skirted over the, over the iceberg in many respects uh, about my knowledge, about my experiences. I, and when you say, I could write a book, I could write a book. So that's one <laughs> thing as well. Yeah. And the one thing as well, I think which I hope I'm going to be bringing to the, the, to the, the, the flavor of this particular um, uh, uh, podcast is the idea of anthropology, looking at the idea of anthropology and ethnography, because again, it's all about narrative, all about storytelling. It's all about the human side and making the science, the hard science that comes out, the data I have to deal with, and turning it into something meaningful. So that's, again, the two things I would be focusing on over the next 12 months. Perfect. And I couldn't wish for something better in a co-host. All right, guys, that is it for this recap of 2023 in the Paleo Post podcast. We will see you next year. Signing off. Bye.